Hello and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. My name is Kimberly Green. I'm PATH's Global Director for HIV and TB, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the satellite session, Bringing PrEP Closer to Home, Why is Now the Time to Differentiate PrEP? This is a two-part session co-sponsored by AVAC, PATH, International AIDS Society, and USAID, and it explores ways that countries are adapting and simplifying PrEP services to make them easier to access and best respond to client preferences. As part of the session, we'll also be featuring how COVID-19 has impacted and in some ways accelerated efforts to decentralize PrEP. So, so PrEP, prep dosing, dosing and, and formulations are evolving, evolving. From, from the 2015 WHO guidelines that recommended oral uh, daily PrEP, prep as an option for those at substantial risk of HIV to the 2019 event-driven PrEP, prep guidance that includes options of intermittent dosing among men who have sex with men. And more recently, the exciting early results from the HPTN-083 study on long-acting injectable cabotegravir among men who have sex with men and transgender women as well as many other exciting studies that are in the pipeline exploring new ways of dosing and formulating PrEP, all helping to increase options and flexibility in how PrEP gets delivered. So preferences among uh, adolescent girls and young women, key populations, men and others, uh, around how PrEP gets delivered are also evolving. Despite slow rollout of PrEP initially, there are now more than 78 countries offering PrEP, uh, many who first started with clinic-based models. However, in the past couple of years, there's been increasing diversity of service models that include a blend of community-based providers, use of virtual tools, and engagement of the private sector. These models are all looking at different ways to increase options and to simplify steps to PrEP from the point of screening and initial monitoring uh, and continuation, such as uh, through same-day PrEP prescriptions, home lab services, uh, or self-sampling, and less frequency of refills. So now turning to our session overview, uh, part one was a pre-record, so please make sure you catch it. It's on the on-demand channel. It features three exciting differentiated PrEP case studies of a female sex worker led PrEP in Ethiopia uh, by Fetsie Keder of PSI, uh, KP led PrEP services in Thailand by Nitya Panyapak of the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, and online PrEP in South Africa by Sika Mulek from WITS RHI. So now turning to our session today, uh, you'll be hearing first from Jessica Rodriguez, AVAX Director of Product Introduction and Access, who will help us frame why differentiating and diversifying PrEP service delivery matters. We'll then hear from Anna Grimsred, who is the lead technical advisor from IAS, who will be reflecting on the three examples that uh, I, I previously described from Ethiopia, Thailand, and South Africa. Then we'll hear part two of the country case study, starting first with Elise Stung, who's the clinical director from the Kelly Ross Pharmacy One Step Prep Program uh, in Seattle, followed by Tom T. Tran uh, from PATH and Lu Chung uh, from G Link Clinic in Vietnam, who will be talking about key population led clinics and some of the adaptations during COVID 19 followed by Habel Alangwa, who's the chief of party for Afia Zawani, who will present on dreams uh, uh, and some of the really innovative work they're doing with adolescent girls. After that, we'll have a panel discussion really reflecting on introducing and scaling differentiated prep models, hearing from Linnea uh, Lilian um, Mukoyosi, who is a youth uh, ambassador at the, the Tanzania Youth Alliance. Robin Eagle, who is a senior biomedical advisor from USAID. Uh, Rachel Bagley, who's the coordinator for HIV prevention and testing at WHO. And Dr. Fenty Tu Hung, who is vice director at the Vietnam Administration for AIDS Control. We'll then have a wrap up. If you have a question, please post your question in the chat function. Thank you. And now we'll turn to uh, Jessica, uh, who will frame why differentiating uh, PrEP matters. Thank you, Kim. It's my pleasure to be here today to set, set the, the scene, scene and make, make the case for diversifying PrEP delivery. So improving access to HIV prevention is critical if we want to see meaningful reductions in new HIV infections. 
the use of oral pre-exposure prophylaxis or oral PrEP has gradually increased over time with an estimated half a million people initiating PrEP worldwide um, by the end of 2019. But eight years after PrEP was approved and five years after the WHO recommended oral PrEP for people at substantial risk of HIV infection, we are far from reaching the global target of 3 million users by the end of 2020. We have no time to lose. Now is the time to reimagine how PrEP can be delivered more effectively to those who need and want it. Even under optimal conditions, it can be a challenge for healthy individuals to um, become and stay motivated to prevent any uh, condition or illness. And early PrEP delivery models um, did not make that any easier. With a standard of care that required about uh, six visits to a health facility to uh, receive HIV testing and refills, um, taking PrEP can place a burden on users um, by requiring them to go to a facility where they sometimes may face stigma, stockouts, and long waiting lines. It also can place an extra burden on already strained healthcare systems to screen clients and to dispense refills. So essentially in the early days of PrEP delivery, people were retrofitted to programs as opposed to PrEP programs being designed around the needs of potential users. And PrEP delivery was largely influenced by the early um, days of ART, which were mostly clinic-based and less client-centric as compared to the array of differentiated service to, services we see today. But more recently, PrEP programs began to dismantle these barriers to access and to adapt differentiated delivery models to PrEP, drawing inspiration from more contemporary and community-based approaches to ART. So recognizing um, that many different um, promising practices and potential models uh, were being piloted. AVAC, PATH, and IES designed and developed an online survey um, to try to elevate uh, these models and pilots. More than 50 respondents from more than 15 countries um, were collected, and six of these uh, programmatic examples are featured as part of this session. Um, as well as the pre-recorded session uh, related, to, related to the satellite. So as we assess the results of the survey, four key themes rose to the top. And these really map quite well to the differentiated service delivery building blocks, which you'll hear from Anna later um, in a moment. So these four themes are convenience. We really saw a shift to multi-month multi dispensing um, for new and continuing users from a typical one month refill to as long as three months um, for daily and event driven prep. We also saw, saw an uptick in the use of online platforms for communication with providers and clients alike uh, using phones, WhatsApp, video chat for daily reminders, um, for risk assessments, for consultations, all the while ensuring confidentiality and personal safety. More programs are relying on peer-led and peer-assisted models um, and approaches to outreach, to testing and counseling and distributing refills um, where clients can experience a higher level of trust and comfort. And lastly, um, there is a shift to client empowerment and the importance of self-care and uh, self-assessment of risk as exemplified by increasing number of programs that are providing the option for testing through blood-based HIV self-test kits, as well as safe home specimen collection through mobile lab services and by healthcare workers. So while clearly COVID-19 spurred and hastened the need for innovation uh, around PrEP delivery, the spark was already lit prior to the pandemic. And we want to harness the momentum to maintain and monitor the impact of these changes on increased PrEP access, uptake, and continued use. The programmatic examples you will hear more about in this session are promising, but ongoing operational research is required. And 
we want to engage in this um, implementation science to grow the body of evidence on the impact of differentiated models on PrEP uptake and continued use to further simplify and streamline testing, recognizing um, that clinical monitoring is still key. Um, and to identify the specific program elements that are not unique to oral PrEP delivery, but can and should continue even with the advent of longer and multi-prevention, multi-purpose HIV prevention products in the pipeline. Because while these new products may remove some barriers to access, they might also introduce unforeseen hurdles as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Anna Grimsrud from the International AIDS Society, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the excellent pre-recorded content that forms part of this satellite in the hope that you'll all log in after the session to hear some of these presentations. The pre-recorded session features an introduction from Dr. Kimberly Green, who you've heard from, as well as these three presentations from Ethiopia, Thailand, and South Africa. You're going to hear from Dr. Fethia Keder, the Associate Director of Quality Assurance at PSI in Ethiopia, about their PrEP program for female sex workers. From Dr. Nataya Panyapak, the Executive Director of the Institute of HIV Research and Innovations, or IHRI in Thailand, about their key population-led health service that includes community-led delivery of PrEP. And from Dr. Saika Mullik, the Director of Implementation Research at the Witz Reproductive Health Institute in South Africa, and Project PrEP, which focuses on adolescent girls and young women. Now, as you've heard, the approach of differentiated service delivery adapts the building blocks, or the when, where, who, and what, to provide a client-centered approach to services. COVID-19, in many instances, has accelerated a transition towards differentiated PrEP, and I'm gonna use this framework of the building blocks to highlight some of the examples shared in the pre-recorded session. In Ethiopia, the PSI program for female sex workers has been operational since September, 2018. Recently, the program transitioned to having all services offered through the drop-in centers and putting a greater emphasis on online services or cyber education. PrEP clients had to return three months after initiation instead of one month and were provided with three months of PrEP. There has also been an emphasis on intimate partner violence screening and ensuring PrEP access for survivors of gender-based violence. In Thailand, the Princess PrEP program has been running for five years with funding primarily through public donations. The key population lay providers were legalized last year in 2019 and have the ability to provide many services with remote prescriptions provided by clinicians. As a result of COVID-19, there has been extended PrEP scripting and an increase in telehealth. Further, to ensure the safety of their clients, they're trying to ensure the shortest time spot possible is spent at facilities. And so there's been an increase in self-sampling for HIV testing and STI testing. In South Africa, Project PrEP started in 2018. With COVID arriving in the country, the project followed the National Department's guidance, extending PrEP refills to two months and worked to decentralize services further from mobile clinics, ensuring home delivery for those who couldn't access services and introducing more community delivery. In addition, as shown on this figure here, there's been a huge emphasis on their online platform. They doubled the investment spent on social media efforts and looked to increase both the reach and engagement across social media and were very successful in doing so. And this worked to include COVID-19 messaging along with PrEP messaging for their users. And so we are recommending that we take this opportunity to pause and think about what adaptations that we've made because of COVID-19 and which of these should and could be sustained going forward. As is stated on the slide here, in the rush to return to normal, consider which parts of normal are really worth rushing back to. And as said by Dr. Penupak in her pre-recorded presentation, many of the adaptations in their program are likely to become the new normal. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Elise Tung, and I am a pharmacist with Kelly Ross Pharmacy in Seattle, Washington, and in the USA. And I'm here to speak about our pharmacy-driven one-step prep program. Our program um, is based in Seattle, Washington, and it started in March of 2015 and is currently running. And it is based off of a protocol called a collaborative drug therapy agreement, um, where we have a medical director, and his name is Dr. Peter Shallot, and he gives us the ability to uh, order labs, make an assessment, and write prescriptions, and do all the dispensing in one location in one convenient step for patients. Um, this is operated by one full uh, pharmacist plus a pharmacy technician. The revenue of the clinic is all driven by billing as providers and pulls a sustainability outside of reimbursement of medications. The motive behind our clinic setup was to find a way to get the medication prep uh, into the hands of its user in a more readily form, um, thinking of innovative models. Uh, so prior to March 2015, uh, a person's only method of obtaining prep was through the traditional healthcare setting. And we decided to think outside the box um, and decide where can we, how can we help patients get their prep um, who don't normally have access to a healthcare facility. And we followed the direction of the CDC um, and um, looked in, uh, into the pharmacy model for uh, pharmacists to be able to dispense medications. And one of the reasons um, that pharmacies are so, so well suited is because there are over 60,000 community pharmacies in the U.S., much higher numbers than traditional healthcare facilities. There are over 95% of patients who live within a five-mile radius of a community pharmacy. Um, currently, uh, PrEP providers can easily span over hundreds of miles from a single location. Um, and so if we were to able to move PrEP provision into a pharmacy, it could increase access dramatically. Pharmacies typically have longer hours and are open um, different hours than healthcare facilities. Um, pharmacists are already experts in adherence counseling, um, which is really important for the efficacy of daily uh, PrEP. And we can also improve vaccination rates um, such as hepatitis B. Um, and pharmacies also have the ability for walk-ins um, and HIV testing. Um, and really, again, just increasing access outside of a traditional healthcare model. So we, our model is operated on uh, the initial screening visit, um, which is all done by patient requests. Patient yourself identifies once again on prep, they make an appointment with us. The technician then um, coordinates the care, gets them on patient assistance programs um, and regulates um, insurance information. And then um, the first visit is with the pharmacist. The pharmacist does all the labs, all the blood draws, um, does the patient assessment um, and does all the risk reduction counseling, and then uh, writes a prescription for PrEP and the patient is able to walk out with uh, their PrEP the same day if they qualify. First follow-up is in one month um, for HIV testing and adherence and side effect assessment. And if all is good, then they can get additional refills and um, monitoring is again every three months. And this is all done by the pharmacist in the pharmacy location. Now, since COVID has occurred, um, um, or I guess, so program results really quickly. Uh, initial appointment is anywhere between 45 to 60 minutes, and that includes a lot of counseling. Um, Follow-up appointments are about 15 to 30 minutes. But not only do we do PrEP, but we also do PEP, STI, um, treatment and screening and all immunizations. The pharmacist is the ones that does the, all the lab testing, including um, blood draws and finger stick for rapid HIV tests. And then the patient is sent to the restroom to do self-collection of all the swabs and urine, urine samples, and we do all site testing. Um, our um, program utilizes a lot of uh, patient uh, drug assistance programs to ensure that uh, PrEP is affordable for anyone and everyone. 90% of our patients pay $0 every month for all labs and medications and services, 
74% of our patients are same day start, and we have a dropout rate of about 19% who are lost to follow up. 80% of our patients do not identify having a primary care provider. Um, and so between March of 2015 to February 2018, there were a total of 714 patients evaluated, and 695 patients were, which is 97%, were able to initiate PrEP. Uh, and um, in light of COVID-19, we moved our service from the pharmacy uh, to a telehealth program uh, in less than a week. Um, it includes, um, these are the necessity, uh, the necessary parts for uh, a teleprep model and it includes providers who are trained in prep, a clinical coordinator who can manage the scheduling, the paperwork, patient assistance programs, um, electronic health record um, that also has a patient portal that the patient can access, um, a HIPAA compliant video platform, lab testing um, that can either be done in home or in person, and then also medical billing software. I thought I'd spend uh, just a couple minutes on specifically on lab testing since that half has been the biggest question amongst everyone. So uh, the traditional in-person lab testing is still available for folks to come into our clinic and get their labs done, where the pharmacist draws the blood work and then the patient does self-collected urine, rectal, throat, or vaginal samples. Um, this is convenient because when the patient is in, we're able to do the assessment and then also they're able to uh, pick up their medicine at the same time. But due to COVID and risk of exposure, there are many people who do not want to do this. And so we opted um, into a home test kit where the patient is able to do home collection of everything. Um, they do all their self-collected um, urine uh, and swab samples, as well as poking their own finger at home and doing dry blood spots. They mail the kit back to the lab. And once the lab receives it, it is about a one week turnaround time for results. Um, this does require the patient to perform finger stick at home. Some patients are not comfortable with finger sticks. And so we offer a hybrid model of home and in person. So at home, they do all the self-collected swabs and urine samples. Um, and then they find a lab service center near their home where they can walk in and do the blood draw them um, by the lab center. There are multiple lab locations located throughout the U.S. and um, has been fairly convenient for folks who are not comfortable doing a finger stick. And so the difference really with post COVID-19 is that all the services have pretty much remained the same except for the location. Um, visits are done virtually uh, through a HIPAA compliant uh, video session and then home labs in all the steps at screening, at the initial visit, um, one month follow-up and um, all the three month follow-up visits and all the labs and risk assessment and counseling and adherence counseling are all done by the pharmacist still. So our key learnings and challenges um, is that um, when we first started the program, this was a, quite a lot to um, a big endeavor for pharmacists. And we were worried that firm, pharmacists would be intimidated by the service. But what, what we found is that pharmacists really do enjoy the work. Um, it allows them to work at the top of their license, um, move them outside of traditional dispensing role and into a provider role. And pharmacists do enjoy that quite a bit. It also moves um, reimbursement of services outside of standard pharmacy um, medication reimbursement. And revenue is based on pharmacist billing as a provider, um, which is important these days because right now um, reimbursement for medications uh, is a difficult uh, model for pharmacies to maintain um, since reimbursement has been declining due to insurance companies and PBMs. Um, pharmacists can be trained um, in phlebotomy as well as any um, HIV testing, and patients' uh, self-collected STIs are just as effective as provider-collected. Um, of note, it's really important that marketing services um, are critical to our success. If patients cannot find us, um, they cannot, uh, they don't know how to access us. So where do we go from here? Um, we now are moving our telemedicine um, prep service to be a permanent 
it part of our program. So patients will continue to have a choice. They can have a choice of seeing us traditionally in the pharmacy clinic, or if they choose, they can choose to see us via telemedicine. And um, we hope to continue this offering um, as we've seen it to be very convenient for folks during the pandemic, but then also folks just enjoy the convenience of it regardless. So we hope to see more data on this program um, in the months to come. Hello, my name is Han from Park and Dr. Tin from Jilin Kipina Clinic will present PrEP follow-up, key population lab PrEP services in Vietnam. As background, we see that key population role in community-led SIV services took off in 2014 in Vietnam. First, we defining and leading online to offline reach and test campaigns, then offering community testing in 2015, and provide direct HIV services in 2016. The first PP lab clinic was established in 2016 and now increased to 12 clinics in Vietnam. The PrEP model, first defined by the Vietnam Ministry of Health, BAC, and USAID Park Healthy Market, was a key population community based organization and public private clinic partnership approach. TPCBO pair with PrEP clinics to reach clients and support for PrEP appearance and continuations. Today, we are working with 18 clinics in three of the highest HIV burden provinces in Vietnam. Seven among each of private clinics are led and owned by TPCBO. The 10 remaining are public ones. Community monitoring and continuous quality improvement CQI are one of our strong focus for PrEP implementation in Vietnam. Before the PrEP pilot in 2016, we conduct a survey with around 800 MSM and TG women uh, to assess the demand, acceptability, and preference for PrEP services. And the results show that 91% of MSM and TG women report a substantial risk for HIV. 89% said they could choose a PrEP if available. 92% willing to pay half dollar per day for PrEP and 76% willing to pay one dollar per day for PrEP. And one interesting point you can see on the screen is 71% of MSM and PG women select PrEP provided at CBO location. And these are key reasons leading us to implement KP Lab PrEP services in Vietnam. As we can see from our PrEP follow-up building blocks of COVID-19, PrEP services were offered at KP Lab and own clinics where PrEP were initiated the same day. For example, at Jilin KP Lab clinics, all providers, including doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and counselors are MSMs. A healthy market study in 2015 found that majority of MSM and PG women go online and use social media such as Facebook and dating app like a blue or grider. When we started PrEP pilots in 2016, the knowledge level of KP on PrEP were low, and we had to work very intensively with community influencers to co-create and implement the PrEP demand creation campaigns and establish online ecosystems to provide PrEP information to community and link them to PrEP services. And as we can see on the screen, clients can do online risk assessment and book an HIV cell test kit or PrEP service online. We also leverage a wider network of peer influencers to raise awareness on PrEP. And we also use AI uh, app chatbot to respond to typical questions of clients, for example, where uh, we can find PrEP. And most recently, we also set up an HIV and COVID-19 hotline uh, led by community influencers to support providing information on COVID-19 um, prevention and also uh, PrEP services, HIV services, and other information that they need. On the screen, we can see a visual example of our PrEP demand creation campaign online over to you, Tin. Yeah. After years of providing PrEP in Vietnam, up until June 2020, there are more than 6,900 cumulative PrEP users enrolled in PrEP follow-up program with the support of USAID, PAC, Healthy Market, and BAAC. As you see, 73% PrEP users enrolled in KB GLAD clinics. The majority cumulative enrolled on PrEP are MSM with more than 70%. For the COVID-19 response, um, 
for the COVID-19 response, there are changes in breath service flow for new enrollment started with online risk screening and an individual contacting a clinic via app or phone. Then they were carried a blood-based HIV SD kit and tested with the healthcare worker online. If HIV negative, they will carry a three-month supply of PrEP. The same HIV SD process will follow for the initial follow-up and then a quarterly review and HIV test. Here is an example of online promotion for client engagement with Dr. Ashley Clinic. The private clinics and clients strongly endorse the use of little tools during lockdown and want to see this continue post lockdown. So it's time for some data. You can see that in January, we have the typical increase in new prep clients just before the test festivities and then the new enrollment drop of a user. But then toward the end of February and beginning of March, we see another increase in new prep enrollees a pre-COVID-19 lockdown, and then a steep decline during lockdown through March, with a slight pickup in the new clients toward the end of April, when lockdown begins to ease. The important here, the new PrEP enrollment occurred throughout lockdown. There was still demand for PrEP, and that these clinics were able to respond to that need. During the COVID-19 and it's during the COVID-19 and it's lockdown, you can see we added in telehealth, prep, courier, and home lab sample collection for clients who need initial follow-up at home and also telehealth, online consultation for prep continuation. Now over to you, Ms. Tam. We want to highlight some key conclusion and next step. First, we observe that KP clinics are prefer over public ones, but both are important and choice matters for clients. COVID-19 enable more diversification of PrEP services to, uh, to, for clients. And with COVID-19 adaptation, we can see a strong preference for telehealth and virtual PrEPs among PrEP clients. Home lab collection and PrEP drug delivery also provided to be able to uh, be more convenient for urban areas. And moving forward, we plan to scale up this model along with offering mobile prep in per, per the urban environment. And finally, we see that greater diversity of prep service model will be key for rapid prep scale up in Vietnam. We would like to send a special thank you to Vietnam Ministry of Health, VAEC, represented by Dr. Phan Hương at this satellite and USAID for their great leadership. And thank you to KPCBO and prep clinics for their innovation during COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you. So, um, hi everyone, welcome to this uh, presentation. Uh, I'll be talking to uh, bringing PrEP closer home and uh, mostly looking at um, uh, differentiated PrEP for the adolescent girls and, uh, and young women within uh, uh, Kenya. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Habil Alwanga. I'm the Chief of Party for Afya Ziwani, which is a project that is um, within the um, Western region of Kenya. Uh, we are PEPFA funded uh, through USAID and pro provide a comprehensive HIV prevention, testing and care treatment services uh, to the adolescent girls and other populations. We are in our third year of implementation. And uh, like I've mentioned, we are working in, the, in four counties uh, within this region. Um, we have uh, been providing PrEP even before uh, this COVID period, and uh, this PrEP was mostly uh, done through the conventional ways of uh, PrEP education, initiation, and uh, continuation within the health facilities, as well as within uh, our safe spaces, which are the girl hubs. Um, we were able to uh, provide a, a eligibility screening for testing for these uh, uh, girls and PrEP was provided within those uh, uh, two areas I've mentioned, the safe spaces with health facilities. Uh, we also had support groups that were actually there to enhance uh, or increase the adherence uh, uh, of PrEP as well as other uh, layered uh, packages. Uh, at that time, we did not have any, in fact, we didn't even think about any telemedicine or uh, virtual uh, options for PrEP uh, uh, delivery. So, um, 
So Cam, uh, we, when we look at uh, the, the, the building blocks for PrEP uh, in the pre-COVID period, uh, pretty much what you may be familiar with in terms of screening and the PrEP initiation, these were done on the same day, uh, being done within the safe space and health facilities, like I've mentioned, uh, by a physician, nurse, or a, a counselor. And uh, there was, you know, same day HIV testing, uh, risk assessment, uh, and the PrEP counseling. Uh, with the follow-up being done at month one uh, within the health facilities uh, by a physician or nurse, uh, with enhanced counseling on uh, PrEP uh, adherence at month three. I um, mean, follow-ups were done every three months. Uh, again, these were being done at the health facilities by a physician, nurse, or a counselor. And we had testing being done. We made sure that uh, we were able to provide uh, PrEP alongside other uh, prevention services like family uh, family planning and of course, course of course also screening out for for STI. Um, so when uh, we had the restrictions that uh, were put in because of uh, COVID-19, we quickly thought of some of the ways that we can uh, improve uh, our uh, prep uh, uh, prep services to adolescent girls and young women. And one of the areas we did for that was to do home deliveries for the, for the DYW, especially those who were elected to have uh, uh, this uh, um, prep delivered to their place of convenience, for example, their home. Some of them would elect to have that done with them within a market space mm -hmm. where they're able to meet the healthcare worker mm -hmm. or uh, uh, accompanied by the dreams mentor. Uh, we also had this uh, being provided at temporary safe spaces, uh, which uh, basically are um, areas that are, are proximal uh, to the HUAW uh, living place. Uh, and most of them is tended to be uh, the, the HUAW ambassador's uh, home. And of course, the other platform which we're going to be talking about in this session is a virtual uh, uh, safe spaces where we're able to use the telephonic uh, um, uh, models to, 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 ens to, to ensure that we're able to provide PrEP and have it uh, continued. So of course, this was done by our dreams mentors. Um, so we also assessed uh, the, the coverage of uh, uh, our phones within uh, our AGYW our and we found that among the 9 to 17 uh, year olds, at least 76% of them had, self, had access to cell phones, but most of these cell phones were actually belonging to the uh, guardians uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, or parents. Uh, the 18 to 19, 67% uh, actually on their own phones. And uh, if you look at the 20, 24 year olds, the more mature ones, uh, close to 90%, that's 87% actually had their own phones. Uh, and the remainder were able to be reached through their parents' uh, stroke uh, guardians' uh, phones. So we did um, uh, set up some uh, uh, virtual uh, safe uh, spaces. And uh, at that, we actually made use of, of uh, the telephonic, uh, uh, the telephones. Uh, and we did, uh, we have, have actually have about 111 uh, such uh, safe spaces uh, where they're able to use uh, phone, phone calls or even text messaging uh, as well as social media to generate demand. Uh, the, um, the mentors have uh, uh, directories of, 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 of the girls that uh, they, are sub they have within their cohort, also are provided with their time. Uh, we've also, on the other side of it, we found that actually the girls would be able to, you know, send a please call in, please call me feature, which they can they can actually uh, get called on by by, by the mentors. And then within that uh, uh, virtual safe space, there's education that takes place, and then uh, we also have uh, the prep being requested uh, for, you know, uh, by individuals uh, through that uh, through that medium. So this is just an example of part of uh, um, uh, the, the messaging you can see on your left uh, side of the screen. We have uh, um, a WhatsApp uh, discussion within a, a safe space where they are basically providing information uh, on PrEP. Uh, and then yeah, we have some questions being asked by you know, uh, uh, the, the members um, uh, of that uh, virtual uh, safe space within a, a WhatsApp uh, a forum. So we were able to now move into the period, uh, I mean, the COVID-19, and we're actually looking at this as part of what we want to continue going forward. If you look at this, it's almost akin to what we had in the pre-COVID period, 
uh, but what is the difference? The difference here lies within the where, where we find that actually, uh, rather than just having the prayer being provided within the safe space, uh, the physical safe space and the health facilities, we have virtual or mobile safe space uh, provision and uh, also uh, provision, uh, I mean, in terms of initiation and even on the, on the follow-up with the rest of the other items remaining uh, uh, pretty much the same. And so on that end, in terms of a virtual safe space, what you've seen is that uh, uh, the process is able to, you know, the management is able to initiate a discussion on PrEP uh, the girls who are interested in able to enroll on uh, on prep, they um, get enrolled, and they get they get screened using the RAS tool. They are referred to a facility, or a, uh, or the facility uh, person is able to come in, and they get get reviewed. Uh, and thereafter, they are provided with the prep, and we able to have uh, drinks mentors doing a, a follow up or check ins uh, on a, a monthly basis and uh, subsequently quarterly. And they can even get uh, their refills uh, at home or uh, uh, within the safe space uh, or even the clinic. And one of the things you've seen um, uh, over the time is that uh, if you look at the pre-COVID period, we actually were we set it up with a very low uh, enrollment in October uh, for PrEP. Uh, we had a peak in February. February seems to be our best month because we didn't have any um, any strikes that were there within uh, the health facility uh, workers. So that was our best month. But then come uh, the COVID period, we've seen a drop from 119 to 48 to a low 42. But again, once we've been able to put in these uh, measures uh, of a, a virtual safe spaces, we've seen an increase. Again, this is picking up, as you can see in May, we actually had 78. Uh, we have had about 1,022 girls, uh, GYW across 22 wards that we work in. Uh, 22 of the wards that we work in are getting refills uh, from March through uh, through to to to, 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 the, to the period of May. 51% uh, of these being within safe spaces, 10% uh, at home, and 39% within uh, health facilities. And we've seen our girls actually uh, really appreciating um, uh, the fact that you've been able to introduce this uh, uh, um, uh, model of uh, provision of prep, and actually one of them. Uh, indicates that uh, uh, courtesy of, uh, um, uh, of these innovations or this model, they've been able to circumvent the circumstances uh, that were the restrictive circumstances that were put in uh, due to the COVID. Going forward, I think there are a couple of things we've learned. We've seen a very good uptake of uh, uh, telehealth uh, services in Kenya. Uh, so this has enabled the continuity of critical services uh, and the PrEP is one such a uh, service that we've been able to provide. And therefore we're looking to standardize virtual approaches in HIV service delivery so we have the same across board. Uh, the other thing has been quality. And of course there's been questions asked about this uh, including the national team. And so what we have uh, our purpose to do is to develop and distribute key uh, talking points to help to, to guide the healthcare workers in the provision of a, uh, um, uh, you know, delivering these messages virtually as well as our, our mentors. And of course, going forward again, we shall be able to adopt both virtual and the uh, safe in, in space uh, uh, follow up. I want to thank uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, our Department of Health at the county, uh, the NASCO program, uh, and of course, we also have our local implementing partners that we work with, and lastly, USAID. Thank you. So thank you so much to the excellent country uh, presentations. Uh, now we want to turn very quickly to the moderated panel. So first, a question for you, Lillian. You've been a strong advocate for sexual reproductive health um, and HIV services among adolescents and also use of uh, technologies. What's your perspective on how to best tailor PrEP for adolescents and young people? Thank you so much. So I think a lot has been said by the previous speakers on the need to come up, to diversify, to come up with different um, ways that we can deliver PrEP 
to young people especially because it really matters for them where prep is being given who is providing prep and how is the service being provided like a, a whole package of it and i've seen recently how young people make uh, spend most of their time in social media it's another area that i would recommend we should focus on in terms of like uh, making sure that we reach out to as many in terms of information sharing but also i've seen examples of young people um reaching out through for instance instagram dms uh, via different uh, different pages that we run through social media uh, to request for access to services and most of these you'd find they would really not prefer to walk into the clinics to get services and i keep reminding myself that covid-19 has been quite a wake up call to all of us to uh, be prepared in advance for any natural disasters whatever that happens we should not be in a position where young people especially do not get access to services we need to have as many options of delivering prep services um and make sure that we accommodate everyone according to their needs thank you thanks so much lillian that's brilliant um now over to you robin uh usaid pepfar has been a, a long standing leader in prep um and has moved very quickly to adapt prep service delivery in light of covid-19 what are your takeaways in terms of how uh prep service delivery might be able to be further adapted uh in the post covid-19 world thanks kim um and and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this really exciting satellite um, I think in, as I was reflecting on this question, I think in many ways um, the HIV field is in a unique position already to maintain our programming as well as um, support the COVID response. Just having to do a lot more work or the same work with the same funding or even less funding as the years progress. So we're already in a habit of innovating and moving and pivoting to when programming isn't working very well, especially in the last few years. Um, so I think COVID has really been an opportunity to move HIV programming and PrEP in particular forward, um, especially moving to more differentiated service delivery models, um, really as the primary model rather than facility-based models. Um, so even before COVID, hit, generally we were in, in the PEPFAR world expanding rapidly our programs um, with the goal of getting to 1 million people on PrEP by um, end of 2021, which will span more than 30 countries, which is really exciting. Um, but in some places, um, initially we looked at, well, can we combine health, HIV health workers and um, both for treatment and for, for prevention like PrEP with COVID response teams? Um, where, you know, movement has been really restricted. Um, and then where possible, definitely move clients away from facilities. We've heard a lot of really amazing um, examples of that in these presentations. And that's something I think we want to maintain going forward. Um, encourage more multi-month dispensing for PrEP, as well as treatment, but especially for PrEP, um, and allow for a lot of flexibility around that. I think some clients may be able to do take on multiple months of prep doses from their initial visit. And then some may need more check-ins um, and may need to cycle on and off much more regularly. So it's not a one size fits all kind of regimen. Um, we've heard a lot about moving safe spaces to virtual platforms, which is really cool, including peer driven WhatsApp support groups, um, online reservation and scheduling apps for clients, which I think is definitely something that can be expanded and used um, even after the, hopefully when the COVID pandemic subsides, um, more use of social media platforms, including using promoted posts and targeted ads to reach out to um, populations at higher risk who may be frequently frequenting certain pages um, and encouraging them to look at, look into taking prep. Um, and then of course, all of the decentralized pickup points, including, um, which also include motorbikes, mobile vans, and really exciting drug ATMs where people don't even have to have any contact with a person and they can just pick it up from a machine. Um, of course, the bigger challenges are where there's less tech technology or less access or restricted access to the social media platforms. So that's something we're continuing to explore. Um, and you know, we've heard already in these presentations today, reinvigorating HIV hotlines in many countries and continuing to get word out um, via community radio. Great. So we're 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm fine to move forward. Thanks. Thanks so much, Robin. Um, and um, all, all brilliant thoughts. Uh, I wanted just to turn to now uh, Rachel from WHO, uh, you know, given some of the exciting studies that are underway, given the results from the ECHO study, from WHO's perspective, uh, you know, where do you think we're headed in terms of PrEP service delivery? Well, I think we've had from all these fantastic presentations, lots of, lots of good thoughts about how we can deliver PrEP more simply. And I think, you know, we've, we've started in a cautious way with lots of laboratory tests, um, with a very over-clinicalized um, way, of, way of delivery. And I think we have to learn from what we're learning in, in this time of COVID to simplify PrEP delivery. And, you know, to take Robin's point, this is going to work for some people, um, people maybe who are, who are PrEP users and, and, and know the system, but we will also need to nurture and support, particularly the younger PrEP users, um, or where PrEP is, is new. Um, and uh, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so I think differentiated PrEP, as Anna has coined it, is, is the way to go. Um, and lots of exciting stuff from these presentations. So thank you so much for a wonderful session. Thanks so much, Rachel. That's great. Um, now over to you, Dr. Fan Hung. Vietnam has been a longstanding leader uh, in PrEP, um, has been very quick to adopt innovations. You know, what's your perspective as a country leader in PrEP um, in light of COVID-19? Where do you see Vietnam headed in differentiating PrEP? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so given the increase um, increase in the HIV prevalence among who have sex with men over the past five years. We began to uh, prioritize PrEP as a key intervention starting in uh, 2016 and launched the first um, uh, PrEP uh, program together with the uh, USAID uh, PAP the PHO, uh, in early of the 2017. Uh, we were focused on reaching MSN transgender women and HIV zero uh, discarded. Uh, couple and uh, PrEP uh, services uh, have seen um, has been uh, scaled up uh, to 28 provinces uh, with more than 150 sites, support from PECFA, Global Fund, and WHO. And as PrEP uh, scale, um, uh, scale um, it, uh, it is available uh, to the wide range of population at risk of HIV that all have different. Uh, PrEP services uh, prevention, uh, pre, uh, preferences. Uh, to further um, meet of the need of client, we adopt uh, ED PrEP at the end of 2019. And to ensure that MSM has more choice to their uh, dosing option. And we've uh, also developed a uh, five-year plan, scale-up plan, that guide us uh, to how we rapidly increasing the number of people who have access um, uh, to PrEP. And we are aiming for more than 38,000 people on PrEP by the end of the next year. That means it's five times uh, of the current number uh, uh, this year. And when COVID-19 began hitting up uh, in Vietnam, I led urgent adaptation to our PrEP and uh, AOP program to ensure uh, ongoing um, uh, service uh, access to current and new client. And we learned that uh, how to use a virtual uh, telehealth uh, option to communicate with the client and how to efficiently uh, offer home delivery to uh, of medicines. We also learned that the client like this option because they were more convenient and uh, felt safe. And uh, we know that um, if we uh, offer choice uh, of client in urban, uh, uh, peri, uh, urban and rural uh, area, that is will increase the uptake and access, which is a, um, a critical of, um, for people at risk of HIV and supporting Vietnam goals of ending it by 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fan Hong. Thank you so much to the panelists, to the speakers. Uh, this was such an exciting session. There's so many examples of simplifying PrEP and making sure it's more easily accessible uh, to those who need it. So with that, a uh, huge thank you. Uh, and um, that's the end of the session. <laughs>